I love the other song that says, there's no other word for grace but amazing. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? I feel like I have already had myself some church. Amen. This choir blessed my heart. The music blessed my heart. The worship unto the Lord. What an honor it is to just be in the presence of God. Can we just raise our hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. What an honor it is to be at the Sweetwater Church of God today. I count this a great honor to fill the pulpit of a man that I regard highly today. I love Brother Philip Napier. Love him as a pastor. Love him as a man of God. And I've got some big shoes to fill. That's why I wore the biggest pair I had today. <clears throat> but I'm honored and I appreciate this man of God giving me the opportunity today. And I appreciate the kind words that Sister Tracy said today. When she talked about I have been in the ministry for 43 years, the part she didn't tell you, I was just a little bitty pup when I started. Amen. Do doing this a long, long time. But I'm grateful and honored today to be with you. We're glad to be back in South Carolina. I'm glad to have my wife with me today. Diane, would you stand? Let everybody see you how pretty she looks today. Amen. I don't know how I hooked up with that girl, but it was the grace of God. And I'm so glad. What a wonderful wife. And I love her and appreciate her so much. Glad to be with my family today. I uh, appreciate them so very, very much. They have been supportive. You know, it, it's, it's great when the people who know you the best still support you. Amen. <laughs> and I'm so glad to be with all my family. Glad that Brian could be with us today. Amen. Always good to be with Brian. We've had the wonderful privilege to be with him on many occasions in the home, and it's good to be in church together with him today. Praise God. I just believe that God is up to something today, not because I'm here, but because he's here. I believe something is about to happen in this place, and I believe if we allow God to do what he wants to do, can be life-changing for some people. I believe that there are some people here today that can leave different than what you came. In fact, I believe you can be different more so than you've ever been in your whole life because God's got a plan for this service. Amen. Amen. I just want to share. I've been praying and seeking God this week, and I do believe that I have the mind of the Spirit, and I believe that I have something on my heart that I want to share with you today. And I just ask you to stand, if you will, for the reading of the Word of God. We're going to go to the left side of the Bible, way back in the Old Testament, in Second Samuel chapter 9. Second Samuel chapter 9. And I want you to listen carefully to these words. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Makur, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Makur, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David. He fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Here is your servant, 
So David said to him, do not fear. Somebody say that with me. Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Now go to verse 13. Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame. Now, Father, we just commit this service to you. We thank you for the reading of the word of God. Now, let this word accomplish that for which it has been set forth and ordained. And God, do the work that no man can do in this house today. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. Amen. Before you're seated, look at somebody and tell them this. This is my last day in Lodabar. This is my last day in Lodabar. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. Hallelujah. One thing that every believer under the sound of my voice needs to understand is regardless where you are, regardless where you are, regardless what you're going through, regardless where you find yourself today, whatever your plight is, God is aware of your plight. God knows where you are. You may come under the radar and your pain may come under the radar of man. It may never land on the radar of man, but let me tell you, you're right smack dab in the middle of the radar of God. God knows where you are today. Hallelujah. God has a plan. God has a plan. God moves providentially for us. I love that. You know, if it's a man thing, it's a man thing. But if it's a God thing, it's a God thing. And God is working providentially for us. You know, even though God is working providentially for us, there are times that God seems stagnant. Have you ever been there? I mean, you pray and, and no answers are coming down. You pray. In fact, the, 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 the prayer seems like it just hits the ceiling and comes right back down. And we go to church and other people get a word from the Lord. And I never seem to be called out in the service. Nobody ever prays over me. I, I, I keep doing the right things, but God, nothing's happening. Where are you? I don't hear your voice like I want to hear, Lord. It, it seems like you're stagnant right now. But can I tell you this morning? God is not stagnant. God is at work in your life. God is working. God is working. God is at work in your life. He is working behind the scenes when we cannot even see, when we don't even understand, when we don't even know. God is orchestrating some things behind the scene. He's lining up uh, perfectly today. He is connecting you to a time. He is connecting you to a place. He is connecting you to a situation, hallelujah, that's getting ready to change your present circumstances circumstances. Woo! Somebody ought to shout amen to that. Amen. See, God has a destiny for everybody in this room. You say, Brother Sam, you don't know me. I don't care where you came from. I don't care who you are. I don't care who your daddy is. You have a destiny from God. Hallelujah. God has a destiny and God is working providentially right now in your behalf. Hallelujah. But I want you to make no mistake about it today. Every one of us in this room, we've been through some crazy stuff. <laughs> That's the only way I know how to say it. I mean, we've been through some crazy stuff. You know those times that you sit around and you scratch your head and you say, how in the world did I get here? How in the world did this happen to me? And, and, and better yet, why did this happen to me? Why am I at this place at this time in my life? Why am I here? Well, I want to introduce you today to a man in the Bible that is very interesting. I want to introduce you to a man named Mephibosheth. Now, how would you like to be strapped with that name? How would you like for your teacher to try to pronounce that when you go to school. You got to write it on all the important papers. 
All the kids make fun of you, give you nicknames, Mephib or Fib. You know how it is. I don't know how well he liked his name. You know, I don't like my name. My name is Stanley. Sister Tracy introduced me as Stanley Rutland. I've never liked that name. You know, Stanley, when you hear that name, a lot of times when you watch shows on TV, the guy named Stanley is a nerd. He's got those weird glasses on, combs his hair funny. You know what I'm talking about? He's the weird character. Now, I've never liked that name. So I named myself Stan. Now, all you folks that have known me from the valley, you know what I was called the other day? Friday, I was called a valley rat. I haven't been called a valley rat in a long, long time. But I'm from Gloverville, over in the valley. Used to be Horse Creek, but now we've moved up a little bit. We're Midland Valley now. And there's some valley rats out there. I'm talking to some of you. <laughs> I'm among some friends. All my friends that I grew up with call me Stanley. My brother will not. He is a rebel. He will not conform to call me Stan. Other members of my family call me Stan now. But my brother will not call me Stan. He calls me Stan, my first name, and Lee, my second name. I was talking to my mom one day about my name, and I, I don't even know how we got on that subject, but I was talking to her. I said, Mom, I don't like my name. I said, why in the world did you name me Stanley of all names? And Mom looked there, and she thought for a minute, and she looked at me, and I'll never forget what she said. Mom looked at me, and she said, you know, I don't like that name either. <laughs> I said, I'm glad you didn't name me Sue or something like that. <laughs> Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, when we begin reading and learning about this man, the Bible tells us that he finds himself in a place called Lodabar. Lodabar. Now, Lodabar... By interpretation, literally means a place of no pasture. One other interpretation that I read about says it is a place of nothingness. It is a desolate place. It, it is a place of no hope. It's a place of rejection. And of all the things that I just said, that's one of the harder things. It's a place of rejection. Nobody wants to be rejected, but Lodabar meant a place of rejection. It was barren. It was dry. It was depressing. It was all the D words that you can think of. I'm telling you, it was a place of rejection. People that were put in Lodabar were put there when people didn't know what else to do with them. I mean, when they didn't know anything else to do, they put people in, in Lodabar. But I want you to hear something. Lodabar is not just a physical location. It's not just a physical place. It was a physical location, but it's more than that. It is also a mental location. And it's also a spiritual location. It's very important to hear that. Lodabar. I believe that all of us under the sound of my voice and including the guy that's doing the talking right now, we have had our Lodabar experiences. In fact, I am convinced this morning that through prayer this week that there are some people that are going through Lodabar experiences under the sound of my voice this morning. You're in a place called Lodabar. But I want you to know something today. 
I believe God brought me by this way to just give you a word and tell you that you have spent your last day in Lodabar. You're in Lodabar, you're going through some Lodabar experiences, but I'm telling you, God is getting ready to bring some folks out of Lodabar today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me talk about the gloaters and the haters just a minute. You know, there are some folks that are happy that you're in Lodabar. Oh, yeah. There, there are some people that are sitting back gloating and say, yeah, he's getting what he deserves. I knew he wasn't going to ever amount to anything. And I knew that one day it was going to catch up with him. And he's getting it now. He's getting everything that he deserves. And they're sitting back with their arms folded. And they're the haters. And they're gloating over your situation that you find yourself in today. But I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. God has a way of bringing all of your gloaters and your haters into a stadium. Woo! I, I'm just about getting ready to shout now. God has a way of bringing all of your gloaters and your haters and bring them into a stadium. And he puts you on the 50-yard line and he shines his light down on you. And he shows all of your gloaters and your haters what he can do because he's God that can do anything. Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. My God. Hallelujah. He's about to show some people what he's going to do through your life. Because God has a destiny for you. Hallelujah. You know, there are some folks that even have the audacity to feel, to feel sorry for people in Lodabar. Yeah. I mean, they feel sorry for people that are in Lodabar. They say things like, I'm so sorry that he's down there. I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry for him. There are people that, I love this one, they, they say, bless his little heart. Bless his little heart. I, I want you to do this. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now, and I want you to tell them, you don't have to feel sorry for me any longer because today I'm coming out of Lodabar. Hallelujah. I am coming out of Lodabar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God. Woo, hallelujah. Somebody's about to get this today. Amen. David rises up. I, I, we pick it up in, in chapter 9. And David is now on the throne. He is the king. And he begins to speak out. And as he rises up and he asks a question. And his question is this, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Is there anyone left? And I don't want you to miss what I'm about to say. David did not ask this question he did not ask if there is anyone who is worthy. And he did not ask the question, is there anyone qualified in the house of Saul that I may bless? If that were be the case today, most of us would have to check out right now and go home. Because I am not qualified. And I'm sure not worthy. I'm not worthy and I am not qualified. But I'm here to tell you this morning, I am a survivor and so are you. Hallelujah. You've been through some stuff and you've been down the road and the devil thought he had you put in a box and locked away for good. But I'm telling you here this morning, hallelujah, I'm telling you, you are still left. Woo! Hallelujah. And the reason that you're still left is because God is not finished with you yet. The reason that you're still left is because the devil cannot kill you. 
Why do you say that, Brother Stan? I'm telling you, if he could have killed you, he would have already killed you. Hallelujah. He'd already put you away for good. He would have already made sure that you'll never rise up again. But God has a plan for your life. God is still in control. God is still at work in your life. And you're one of the ones that's still left. Hallelujah. Woo. I'm left. Is there anyone left? Woo. Hallelujah. Sometimes when we hear that word, it almost sounds bad. Because one day I was left. My sisters left me. See, I'm the baby in the family, and I'm proud of that. My brother thinks I'm the special one in the family because I'm the baby. <laughs> and I am, I am. My sisters were going to Augusta, but they always went to Augusta because they went to Shoney's out on the Gordon Highway when they used to have the little car hops that came around, like Sonic has today for the younger people. <laughs> And back in those days, people would just cruise around the restaurant, round and round. Where in the world that came from, I have no idea. But the, the soldiers out at Fort Gordon came to Shoney's. And so I begged my sisters to let me go with them because I knew they were going to Shoney's and I wanted to go too. And my sister looked at me and she said, I'll come back and get you later. I'm not kidding you. This is a true story. We live up on Sugar Hill in Gloverville. My dad named it Sugar Hill because he said it's the sweetest place on earth. And up on that hill, I went down the little driveway and I stood at the road and I watched the car go down the hill. I saw the brake lights come on down at the bottom of the hill and the turn signal to turn left and I knew that they were leaving and I stood there and I waited because I said, they're going to come back and get me. They're going to come back and get me. You know what? I may as well still be standing out there because they never came back to get me. So sometimes when we talk about left, it's something bad. But I'm telling you, when David says, is there anybody left, he was talking about something good. And thank God today, I'm talking to some people that even though you've been through some trials and you've been through some tests and you've been down the road and the devil thought he had you, you are still left today. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're one of the ones that are left. Let me talk about Mephibosheth just a little bit more. The Bible says that Mephibosheth, who was the son of Jonathan, who was the grandson of Saul, the king, was lame in his feet, both feet. Let me talk about his paralysis for just a minute. How in the world did this happen to him? How in the world did he become crippled? Back in chapter 4 of 2 Samuel, chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible tells us that word came to the palace that King Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle, both of them. And there was fear that came to the, to the palace. In fact, the nursemaid that was taking care of Mephibosheth, when she heard about what had happened to the king and to Jonathan, his son, he... She, she decided that we've got to do something here with fear, panic, and all the things that kind of struck her. She, she said, we've got to get Mephibosheth to a safe place. I've got to get him out uh, of the palace. I've got to get him somewhere that he's going to be preserved, somewhere where he will be safe. And so the Bible tells us that in a moment of haste, she picked him up, five years old. 
and gathered the things together and ran out of the palace. And as she was running out of the palace, the Bible tells us that unintentionally she dropped him. She dropped him. Now, this had to be a severe injury for him to be crippled in both of his feet. I, I kind of, in my mind, think of it that he probably had some kind of a spinal injury. I don't know. I, you know, I'm preaching so I can preach it the way I want to. Something caused him to be crippled in both feet, and it was a severe injury, and the result of the carelessness, unintentional carelessness of this nursemaid, the Bible tells us that Mephibosheth was crippled in both feet for the rest of his life. For the rest of his life. I believe this morning that God has brought me to this service and I believe that I am talking to some people that in your lifetime you have also been dropped. You've been dropped. Maybe it was unintentional, just like it was for Mephibosheth, but, but nevertheless, you've been dropped in your lifetime. Maybe some program dropped you. Maybe some health care program dropped you. Maybe somebody on a job came to you unexpectedly and gave you a pink slip and, and they dropped you. We don't need you any longer. Someone came into your life and you, you started a relationship with someone and fell in love with them and, and, and thought that you were going to spend the rest of your life with them and they would be committed to you for the rest of your life. And for some unknown reason, they dropped you. No matter what it is, no matter what has happened, no matter what or who has dropped you, God is getting ready to turn your situation around this morning and he is going to put your feet on solid ground. He is getting ready to establish you even though you have been dropped in your life. God is going to establish you. I got a few things I need to say about being dropped. And I want you to listen very carefully. When I drop you, when I drop you, I also have to give you a name. When Mephibosheth was dropped, he was given a name. He became known as the crippled one. You know what I'm talking about. You know how we do this. He became known as the, the crippled one. So when I drop you, I have to give you a name. And when I name you, your name justifies how I now can treat you. That's getting a little deeper. When I drop you, I have to give you a name, but the name that I give you gives me the right now how I can treat you. There's some people in this place that you have been treated in ways that you never imagined that you would be treated. But someone, because they've given you a name, because they've labeled you something, because they have put a name on you, they think now they can treat you any way that they choose because your name identifies you. My Lord. So I name you when I drop you. And the name that I give you justifies how I can treat you. And that name will always identify you. In the Bible, when we talk about Bartimaeus, we always begin by saying, blind Bartimaeus. Amen. You know old Bartimaeus, you know the blind man. You, you know Mephibosheth, that cripple down there. And so it justifies how I treat you and it justifies how I identify you. And listen to this. 
when I name you, it reminds you that you're not like anybody else. The name that I put on you, when you have been dropped, every time they call your name, every time they speak the name that they have declared over your life, it reminds you that, hey, I'm not like everybody else. Mephibosheth, you were dropped when you were five years old. You're not like everybody else. You're a cripple. Not only when I name you, does it remind you of that you're not like anyone else, but when I name you, I've also got to give you a place. Hello. The place that I give you is a place called Lodabar. Now, don't, don't drop off with me here. Stay with me. I'm preaching and somebody's hearing what I'm saying right now. Somebody dropped you in your life. It might have been a spouse. It might have been a school teacher. It might have even been a parent. I don't know. I don't know who dropped you, but they named you. They identify you. They labeled you. They remind you constantly of that name. There are people that, that's been told when they were just little kids in school that you're a nobody, that you're never going to amount to anything. And all of your life you have been a nobody because somebody put a label on you and they put you in a place. Oh. It's a place of nothingness. It's a place of barrenness. It's a place of no pasture. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being put in this place of Lodabar? But somebody has put you in a place called Lodabar. It's that place on the other side of Jerusalem. It's that place that absolutely nobody goes to. You don't have family reunions in Lodabar. You don't visit family in Lodabar. In fact, the people in Lodabar are there because nobody knows what else to do with them. And the fact that they're there, they're there because, hey, we've given up on you. There is no place for you. They don't fit in anywhere else. I thought about when I was preparing this sermon, I thought about Rudolph. I love that movie at Christmas, one of my favorites. It's, it's classic, and you know that. But you'll remember the island of misfits. You remember that. And all the, the toys that were, had the little broken parts, or when they were being put together, they were put together wrong. And they looked funny, and they sounded funny. They were too tall or too short. I know all about that. Just don't fit in anywhere else. And the people down at Lodabar were like the, the little toys on the island, the misfits. They didn't fit in anywhere. They've been thrown away. They've been discarded by the world and, and, and in fact, forgotten about by the world because we're sure not coming to see you. Something that I need to tell you about Lodabar is this. The people that put you in Lodabar never intended for you to ever come back from Lodabar. In fact, the people that put you in Lodabar intend for you to stay in Lodabar for the rest of your life because you don't fit in anywhere else. You're not like all of us. We're the, you know, the good class of folks. I'll tell you something I despise to hear, and I've heard some pastors say this. I hate when a pastor says, I'd like for you to come and preach at my church. We have a really good class of people. God, have mercy on us. Because that's a church that Jesus would never attend. Jesus is not looking for the class. He's looking for the lost. He's looking for the people that have been discarded. He's looking for the people that everybody's given up on. And there's no place that you fit in but God, I'm telling you, he's looking for you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
So the Bible tells us that that King David asked Ziba, the servant of Saul, is there anybody left? And Ziba made a declaration. King Saul or King David, there is one left. There is one left. He's the son of Jonathan. And he is in the house of Makur. And he's down at Lodabar. And he's lame. I have to label him, you know. He's lame. And David said, I want you to go get him. I want you to go and tell Mephibosheth that the king is calling for him. Now, Ziba, I can just kind of see him when he's getting ready to make this journey. He's trying to figure this out. Are you sure that you want me to go to Lodabar? You know all about Lodabar. You know what's down there, King David. Are you sure that you want me to go there? And David said, go get him and tell him that the king is beckoning him to come to the palace. So Ziba, I, like I said, I'm preaching this sermon, so I guess I get to preach it like I want to. And this is kind of how my imagination is. I see Ziba. Now, you just think about it. Ziba has just left the king's palace. I mean, the plushness, the royalty, the pomp and circumstance. I mean, he was in the presence of the king, and now he is coming into the city limits of Lodabar. First of all, I, I, in my mind, I believe that there was a stench to that place. There was a stench. And he looked around and he saw how desolate it was. And I believe he looked around and he saw how depressing it was. And the people that had been there, many of them had been there all of their lives. And so he knew that he was on a mission and he, he looked around, but he couldn't help but to think, how in the world can anybody survive in Lodabar? And so he begins to call out for the name of Mephibosheth. I, he didn't know where he was or what he looked like. So in my imagination, I, I can just see him going into the city. And as he begins to walk down those dusty, dirty roads, he began to say, Mephibosheth, M M Mephibosheth. And he kept calling out his name, Mephibosheth. And I can just see a couple of gentlemen sitting over here on an old tree trying to get some shade because it's hot. And it's desolate and it's dry and it's barren. And one of the guys looks over and says, Mephibosheth. There's somebody over there calling your name. And Mephibosheth began to listen. And he heard somebody say, Mephibosheth, the king is calling for you to come to the palace. I'm about to get to the good part. When he heard this man call his name that he did not know, he had never met Zeba before. Remember, for five years, when he was five years, he went to. Lodabar. He's never met Zeba. And this man's coming down the road and he's saying to him that the king is beckoning you to come to the palace. He's got a blessing for you. Before I go any farther, I've got to just throw in this little bit of a nugget here. Mephibosheth did not know this man. And I'm going to say to you today, there are people that you don't even know yet. You've never come across their path. 
you, you, they don't know you and you don't know them, but there's some people that's getting ready to come into your life that's getting ready to bless you and you don't even know them yet. Woo, hallelujah. I, I just had to tell somebody that this morning because God's getting ready to bless some folks from people that you don't even know yet. God's going to bring them down the road. Woo, hallelujah. You know why? Because God loves you this morning. Because he loves you. He loves you. He hasn't forgotten about you. He knows where you are. Hallelujah. He's got a blessing for you. Woo. The Bible says that when Mephibosheth heard the voice of Ziba call and said that the king is beckoning you to come to the palace, Mephibosheth got his stuff together. Now, that didn't take long because he didn't have a lot. But whatever he had, he got it together. And I'm telling you, he made his way. But there's a little crook in the little story there to me. Remember something about Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was crippled. <laughs> Mephibosheth, the king is beckoning you to come. I'll be honest with you, I cannot tell you and I can't fully explain to you how in the world he got to the king's palace. But I want to tell you something. When the king calls your name and you've been in Lodabar as long as Mephibosheth has been in Lodabar, when the king calls your name, if you've got to crawl all the way to the king's palace, you're going to get there somehow. Oh, hallelujah. You're going to crawl over people. You're going to crawl under people, around people, and you're going to get to the king's house. Hallelujah. Mm. <laughs> There's some folks you got here this morning the best way you could. I mean, the devil fought you to even come here this morning. Oh, yeah, you've been through hell before you even got here this morning, but you got here. Hallelujah. You climbed up. You came any way you could. I'm telling you, there's some people that are so desperate. We've got to get into his presence today. And here's a story. Mephibosheth now is in the palace of the king. I can't imagine how he felt. And he came before David, the king. And the Bible tells us that he didn't come in with an arrogant spirit. He didn't look at King David and said, it's about time. You forgot me. It's about time. He didn't come in with arrogance. But the Bible says that Mephibosheth fell on his face. He fell on his face. He was afraid and he was fearful. But David said, Mephibosheth, son, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid and you don't have to be fearful because I've brought you here to bless you today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bless you and I'm going to restore all the land that has been taken from your grandfather, your grandpa Saul, all the things that has been taken from you and your family. I'm going to restore it. I'm giving it back. Amen. I'm giving it back. But I want you to hear something. And this is important to this story. Mephibosheth, when David was blessing him and when he was pronouncing restoration over him and blessing over him, Mephibosheth looked at him and he said, Who am I that you would bless me like this? I am nothing but a dead dog. I am nothing but a dead dog. 
hear me for just a moment. The problem was this. Mephibosheth had been in Lodabar so long that Lodabar now is in him. He's been in Lodabar. This desolate, lonely, no pasture, no place for anybody to be. I've been there so long that I am nothing but a dead dog. His mentality was Lodabar mentality. And some of you this morning, you've been in Lodabar for so long, you see yourself as nothing but a dead dog. You see yourself in a place of nothingness and never amount to anything and I'm never going to go in any place and everything that people said about me has got to be true and you've allowed yourself to remain in Lodabar and Lodabar to remain in you. Here's something very important. We can never go to our destiny until we remember our history. Some of you missed that, but I got to say it again. We can never go to the destiny that God, I told you every one of us in this room has a destiny, but you can never go to your destiny unless you remember your history. When David spoke to Mephibosheth, he did not even realize who he was. He had been in Lodabar so long, he didn't understand that his dad was a prince. He didn't understand that his grandpa was the king of Israel. He had been in Lodabar so long that he did not even understand that he also was a prince. And you see, the devil wants to keep you in Lodabar so that you'll never remember your past, so that you'll never remember and never understand where you, you're connected and who you're connected to. He wants to keep you with the mentality that I'll never get through. I'm not going to make it. I can't make it. But God wants to remind you today where your lintage is. Your lintage is that I'm the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you're my child, hallelujah. And I haven't forgotten about you, hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody praise God for that. Hallelujah. 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 My father is God, Jehovah. Yahweh God, the creator of heaven and earth. My elder brother is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Hallelujah. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And one day, every knee is going to bow to my elder brother, Jesus Christ. That's who I'm connected to. Hallelujah. That's who we're connected to today. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The devil has put you in a place that he intends for you to stay for the rest of your life. But the king has sent for you today. The king has called your name. He hasn't forgotten about you, and he knows where you are, and he's bidding you to come. And this story ends. I don't know, Sister Tracy, what time I started preaching. I'm not even sure. But I can tell you this, when I first started preaching this sermon, Mephibosheth, we found him in Lodabar. People had given up on him. People had forgotten about him. He was desolate, depressed, oppressed, you name it, he was there. But now at seven minutes after 12... On Sunday afternoon in verse 13, hallelujah, 13 verses, 13 verses later, 
This man is sitting at the table of the king and he is eating bread at the king's table. Hallelujah. And the Bible tells us that he is not only eating the, the bread, but he has been restored everything that the devil took from his family. He was blessed. And I'm telling you, it doesn't take God but just 13 verses. In fact, God can do one moment. In one moment of time, he can change your whole life. Hallelujah. Stand with me all over the house. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. My God. I believe this morning that God gave me this word. And I believe I've preached this word under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And I believe there's some folks, you know exactly what I'm talking about today. How many like to play checkers? Anybody like to play checkers? You don't have to be ashamed. It's okay. I know it's old fashioned, but I like it. I've been playing checkers for a long time. Never been real good at it. Most of the time when I'm playing checkers, most of my men are off the board. <laughs> and most of the men from my opponent is still on the board. But you know what? If you've only got one checker left, one. And your opponent makes one wrong move just one wrong move you can take your one checker and jump over him and you can look across the table and say king me king me now when you look across the table and you say king me and he takes one of the men that he had taken from me and he has to give it back and he gives it to me and now I've got the two stacked on each other now all of a sudden everything changes the rules of the game just changed everything changed you see what I, I, I now can move places that I couldn't move before I can go places that I couldn't go before and I can attack now because I have been kinged Mephibosheth Come to the palace of the king because I'm going to king you. Hallelujah. In one moment of time for Mephibosheth, everybody on this side, look. One moment of time, it flipped just like that. Can I tell you folks over here? In one moment of time, everything just like that flipped for Mephibosheth. He was done for. Everybody had given up on him. He's that crippled one, you know. They've labeled him. They put him in a place. And he'll never come back. <sighs> but David, a long time ago, made a covenant with his daddy. <sighs> Hallelujah. Jonathan, you've been good to me. Your dad wanted to kill me, but you've been good to me. And I'm going to bless your house. David, after Mephibosheth had spent most of his life in Lodabar, had the opportunity to fulfill a covenant relationship and a covenant promise that he made with Jonathan. And he brought Mephibosheth to the palace of the king. And forevermore, everything that had belonged to his daddy, everything that had belonged to his granddaddy, 
now it belongs to me it's mine you are God's child this morning the devil has tried to kill you but he couldn't kill you because God won't let him he's tried to take everything he's had people that have gathered around you and hated you and mocked you and made fun of you and called you names and labeled you they've even put you in a place but God knew and God knows today where that place is God has never given up on you hallelujah aren't you glad to know today that God has never given up on us I'm telling you he should have given up on us a long time ago but he's never given up on us because he loves us he loves us today I believe I preached to some folks that you need God's help today you needed to know that even though you have been in this place for a while I feel like saying this to you this morning through the Holy Ghost do not receive another bit of mail in Lodabar don't accept another piece of mail in Lodabar because your address is getting ready to change I said your address is getting ready to change God is moving you out of Lodabar God is moving you out as we pray